Welcome back in to the Long Shot Podcast. We are here with McDonald's All-American, second team All-SEC, NBA All-Star, and of course Taco Bell's Taco Bell Skills Competition Champion, NBA All-Defensive Team, and founder of the BAM Foundation with his mother, of course. We got Bam out of bio with us. Bam, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it, Ducky. No, you're Appreciate uh, it. You're very welcome. We, we like to keep the intros nice and thorough, but uh, I want to actually bring it back for a second to your decision to go to Kentucky. Uh, this is something that you and I have talked a little bit about, but uh, but really, I, I want to pick your brain on on what ultimately led you there. You know, I in all everything that I've read and, and heard and talked about is that Coach Cal was very transparent in the recruiting process, and that look, you're going to come here and you're going to play a role, and you're going to be here for a year, and you're going to go to the NBA. What was it about Kentucky that really enticed you as, you know, you could have gone elsewhere and maybe featured some of the things that you feature now, but back, but at Kentucky, you were pretty much asked to rebound, defend, and catch lobs. Uh, one, you know, obviously the, the history behind Kentucky, you know, the blueprint to the NBA, I guess they call it. And uh, two, it it felt like family. Um, you know, my assistant coach was one of those people, you know, on my visit, he he talked to me for like four hours, like just having a conversation. And, uh, you know, all the dudes in the league now that I'm in the NBA, all of them see him as a family also. So, you know, I, it was a great choice because one, like you said, it was transparent and they were honest with me. And two, it felt like family. It's interesting because I feel like from other programs, Kentucky gets a lot of shade of that. Oh, you know, they're just turning out pros. They don't care about players. But everybody that I've come across that's actually played there preaches that same thing. And I see it when you guys, like maybe guys that you didn't play with at Kentucky, but played at Kentucky, like you guys still have that that kinship and that brotherhood. And it runs so much deeper than guys that – you know, you played with, but really just any guy that put on that jersey. And it's like a bonding experience um, in that sense. It seems. Maybe I'm wrong. It is, it's one of those things where uh, you know what they go through. So, like, when Tyler came into the league, I knew what Tyler went through because I went through the same process. And, uh, you know, it's a level of respect when you go to Kentucky and you make it out because – Cal isn't for everybody, and a lot of people know that. You know, he's one of those dudes. He's hard on you. He'll never, he'll never let you have an inch of like complacency. And uh, uh, a lot of times, dudes can't handle that. They can't handle that type of accountability. So, you know, when when you make it out of Kentucky, I gotta, I gotta level of respect for you because I know what you went through and the process that you went. Through. What, give me like a, a specific or, or maybe multiple specifics on how it really helped prepare you for the NBA. And, and maybe that's something on the court, but maybe it's something off it in terms of just how regimented it is. Um, you know, from everything I've, I've heard is that they really treat you like professionals when you're there, where a lot of places, you know, I know when I was in Michigan, this is a knock in Michigan, but like we were treated like college kids, like we were. Uh, and probably for good reason, but it sounds like, it's very different there in that sense. Uh, yeah, we're definitely treated like like men instead of like college kids because one, everybody wants to see Kentucky lose, but we've got like the biggest fan base in college basketball. Yeah, I said it, Duncan, the biggest fan base. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so as a 18 year old kid, that's a responsibility that you got to carry. Like when you go to Kentucky, it's the it's the fear of not being good, being good and getting bashed the whole season and being booed by your own fans. So it's a little different. And then, like they say, we got dudes doing one and done and uh, going one and done. And the fans love us to death. So they try to see us everywhere they can because we're besides Louisville, we're the only that and Kentucky football. We're the only thing they got. So they strive off of us. And uh, it's just a big responsibility for 18-year-old kids. So Cal tries to teach you fast. Like, look, this is how you got to handle this 
process in your life before you even get to the NBA. So we kind of go through a lot of stuff that another college kid would go through at a slower pace, if that makes sense. You talk about how Cal won't let guys get away with much. Is that on the court also? Like I, I, when you're showing up there, is it clear right away what your role is? You know, and it's like, did you ever feel like that was inside of a box? Or are you, you know, able to grow your game and work on your game in that year that you're there? Uh, I was definitely able to grow and work my game. Uh, like I said, it felt like family. So my assistant coach, when uh, like on off days or practice days, we would come in before practice and then sometimes late at night. So I always got to work on my game, even though in the actual game, I never really done a lot of it. But in, in hindsight, it was just like, look, you can do it behind the scenes and have everything there. So when you get to the next level, you're not behind. And uh, I really respected that. But for Cal, yeah, he never let us off the hook. Like it was always organized, we were held accountable. Like if you were wrong, you were wrong. And if you thought you was right, he was like, all right, we're going to watch film and see if you was right. So <laughs> he was one of those coaches. And uh, it, it helped us. It, it turned us into men because at that point, we were held accountable at 18. So when you get into the NBA being held accountable, you, you get a better sense of it and a better understanding of what your job is. I want to talk about the infamous Miami Heat workout, which has been documented and discussed um, many times, but I want to hear your version of it, uh, or, or as much as you're willing to share, I guess I, I should say. There, it's been reported, I'll just say, I'll say that I won't confirm anything, but it's been reported that there was a moment in that workout where you realized what was happening in that they were basically having you guard everybody. They are having you guard the point guards, the wings, and the bigs. Uh, just maybe shine a little additional light on that workout, what you maybe remember from it. Uh, j- just give the people what they, they want here. Once again, we're not asking you to, to go into <laughs> too great a detail, but, but whatever you're willing to share. All right, I got you. So uh, first of all, it was DC who I cursed out. Dan Craig, but uh, so the workout's going on, and we started playing two on two. So we're playing two on two, and the ball would go out of bounds or something. And then DC was like, "I right, bam, top of the key uh, with so and so guard. You got five seconds." So after like the third time, I'm like, "All right, ain't nobody else doing this." Like, I'm the only person defending everybody. So finally, I kicked the ball at, Pat, like, the ball goes over at, like, Patnum because it went out of bounds. And I look at all of them. I, it was Pat, Andy. I think Mickey was there. Everybody was at the table. You know the, you know the table. I know the table. I know the table. So D.C. is at half court. And I'm walking towards the ball, and I look at all of them and say, all y'all got me effed up. And uh, that was kind of like the the cutoff for my workout. Because after that, we did like one more segment and we was done. It, it's interesting because like, first off, you're, you're allowed to curse on here. Yeah, um, this is an explicit podcast. Yeah, but that's fine. I, that's fine that you, you know, bleeped it out. That's cool. Oh, um, so we can curse up here. You can curse, yeah. I sure. see. I didn't know that, Duncan. Yeah, I, but no, just just let it ride. Well, okay. you know, whatever, whatever you feel. Well, I told all of them they got me fucked up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, though, because, like, that in and of itself, like, taking it there for you is... Is I don't want to say a risky move, but it's like at that point you didn't totally know who you're dealing with. Little did you find out, obviously, that that's like the exact reaction that they would love to hear. And and you know if there were any doubts of whether or not you were their guy, I think they all subsided right in that moment. And that like this is our guy. Um, 
I think that that kind of like encapsulates what makes you and, and this organization such a perfect fit. But like, what what have you felt since you've been a member of the Miami Heat um, that that's really been? What have you felt that's helped you be your best version? Like basically day in and day out about the culture. Obviously, Heat culture gets talked about a lot, but how have you seen that really like come through in terms of your development? Uh. They let me be myself, first and foremost. So, uh, you know, they never, they never made me like change who I am. Like from that workout, I always kept that type of energy and that edge. And like you said, they they love like players like that with that type of edge. So, you know, my work ethic just went just went with with the edge, and you know, as it fits the the development caliber that we have here. So that was that was the perfect mix because they like dudes that got edge. They like dudes that you know would back down, talk shit, and uh, work hard. And that's basically what I am. So it kind of just meshed together well. I've I've noticed specifically how much that the organization has pushed you to be a leader. Uh, you know, it, it's funny because. Like people talk a lot about how you're like the heart and soul of our team, obviously one of our leaders. And like sometimes even I forget like I'm three years older than you, which is like it's like kind of like a mental thing that like a mental hurdle that I need to get over. Uh, but that's that's my own issues that I got to deal with on my own. But it's it's crazy to me how you've like been thrown into this. And I, I believe it because I see it every day. Like you're, you're truly built for it. But like how has how has that challenged you? Like, are, are you are you naturally that that vocal person? Because you are the one who's speaking up in every huddle. You are the one who's really pushing it as far as that goes. Hell no, I was not ready for this. But because uh, when I was younger, I was always one of those kids that was like, all right, I'm gonna just lead by example. Like, I don't I don't have to speak. And then it got to the point where I was like, all right, if I speak, what the hell I'm gonna say? Like, who's gonna listen to me? So. When UD tried to put me in this role last year, I was like, yo, UD, like, what do you want me to say? Like, I got Jimmy, who's a five-time All-Star. I got Goran, who was just an All-Star year before that. Uh, who else? I had I had Iggy at the time. You, you were three years older than me. I was like, what am I going to say where they're going to be like, all right, I'm going to listen to this kid. Like, and I would look at you, D, and he'd be like, "Like you just say what you gotta say." And I was like, "Bro, what what does that mean?" So that's when I started. UD started making me do like the cadence when we like break, and it was just to try to get my my leadership role going. And I was like, "All right, so I'm supposed to switch up the cadence every now and again. Like, what? Well, how do I do this?" And he was like, "Bro, just just calm down." And now I've gotten to the point where, you know, I, I trust me and me and Spo trust each other enough to, if I speak, it's gonna be some good shit, and uh, that's kind of how I develop. And now, like you said, I'll be in the huddles. But you clearly had some of that in you, right? Like back going back to the workout when you're you have the confidence to tell people you got me fucked up. Like you have, you clearly have that voice, uh, but I think you finding it is, is, is special. I wanted to ask you too about playing off of each other because your two man game is pretty well documented. It seems like it's evolved a little bit this year. Uh, how has that process been kind of finding counters now that it's, you know, well known that you two have your, you know, your dynamic. Duncan don't get as much shots as he used to. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all I can say, Duncan. But the coaches do a great job of trying to help us evolve our two-man game. And, you know, as you see now, Duncan handles the ball more than usual. So uh, it's just one of those things where it just helps us develop. And it helps his development. Obviously, he needs to dribble instead of just being a spot-up shooter. And, uh, you know, I needed to learn how to play in the pocket. So it kind of help both of us and understand the defense of how we can get each other open. Yeah, I think it's it's grown. Uh, last year, 
I was able to just like fly off of stuff, basically kind of unguarded and, and get to spots on the floor that I was comfortable with. And as a result this year, a lot of that stuff has been taken away. Um, but like Bam, Bam said, coaches have, have helped a ton. But but also I, I think the, the biggest thing has been really kind of continuing to develop the field of like, you know, for example, if, if Bam – Bam is a huge part of both, obviously, our defense, but he's a huge part of our offense as well in that I'm one of the people on the floor who can get him in, in the, get him the ball in a situation where he can really be dynamic. A lot of times when I'm coming off of stuff, you know, the big is also jumping out at me, um, trying to take that away. So if I can get the ball back to him, then he's playing four on three on the backside, which is where he's proven to, to be really, really effective, whether it be attacking the rim or distributing. Um, but it's, it's definitely required some, some creativity for sure. It's, it's a work in progress. As Bam said, I first had to get comfortable dribbling the ball, <laughs> which, <laughs> which took a little bit of time, you know, I, I was basically just asked to, to catch and fire that thing last year, uh, in, in the playoffs, you know, you got to adapt, man, you, uh, you got to adapt, but that, that brings up an interesting point of people talk a lot about versatility and they talk about the ability to score you know, from the paint and the perimeter, Bam possesses like an incredible unique versatility to be able to, first off, defensively, his versatility is off the charts. I mean, it's ridiculous. But then offensively, the ability to handle the ball, you know, be on the perimeter and then also distribute, which I think is a, a hugely underappreciated part of your game. But how have you seen that kind of unlock since you've been in Miami? Is it something that you always felt that you've had and that now you've just had the opportunity to really tap into it? Yeah, uh, it's definitely something I've always had. And, you know, it's something I've always been developing. So when I first got, it's funny, because when I first got my first summer league training camp, Quinny thought I was literally just a role, role big that just played defense. So when we started playing five on five, after the workout, Queen was like, yo, you can actually like dribble. I was like, yeah, like, ooh, what do you expect? Like, and he was like, nah, because I I never really watched you move. And I was like, well, like, yeah, I'm, I'm this, that, and the third. So <clears throat> when we got in summer league, that's when I started to actually exposed to people that I can dribble, pass, defend, and do dynamic thing. And ever since then, it's just been a growing progress. And suppose to let me off the leash more and more to, the, to this point. The thing you left off that list just now is shoot. But it seems like, to me, a, a fan from the outside, one of the parts of your game that's uh, different this year is – your mid range seems automatic and it seems like you're trusting it a lot more. So what was that process like just developing that confidence in that shot? Uh, it wasn't developing confidence. It was more so the, our system flow was, we didn't want non paint twos. I see. So in my mind, I was like, if I make enough of them, Everybody else doesn't have to shoot them, but me. Yeah. So, and then it is, so it's kind of to that point. So Duncan gets to shoot threes and I get to shoot my middies because one, I'm quote unquote, an undersized center against dudes that are like seven one. So like, I need another tactic besides going full speed, you know, as somebody seven one two two ninety. I I, I want to go on record and say I, I still think that you're incredibly underappreciated, underrated. I think that the the general media still doesn't give you the credit that you deserve. I'm I'm curious because I've noticed this being your teammate. In terms of around the league, though, you have a ton of respect and appreciation from other players. And I, I see it all the time. I, I remember after we played uh, in Brooklyn, KD's post-game comments about, you know, you have 40. And it was like, he's basically like about time. Like, you know, like Bam's like that. Like, like, like he can go and get you 40, which I don't think a lot of people realize that, that you're still, you're capable of doing, even though you've done it. Uh, another example is 
uh, on JJ Reddick's podcast, D'Lo uh, went on and said that if there was anybody that he would build around, it would be you. So I guess I know you have that chip because I, I, I'm with you every day and I know you have the chip of, you know, whatever ESPN insider, this or that, not giving you the love that you deserve. But what does it mean to you that your peers really respect your game and, and know what you're bringing on a night in night out basis? This is all respect at the end of the day. And uh, I'm not one of those dudes that's going, you know, I keep it simple, Duncan. You know, that, that's all we do. I keep it simple. I get straight to the point, straight to the money. And uh, that's it. And, you know, the media doesn't like that. The media thinks that's boring. That's why nobody really was so shocked about, like, Tim Duncan. You know what I mean? Like people paid attention to Tim Duncan. Like everybody in the league knew who Tim Duncan was, but like the media, social media world never gave him his flowers while he was there. You know what I mean? So I feel like I'm I'm in that type of role. Like I get my I get my appreciation when I'm done, probably one day. Or people might be like, "Look, like he is that." Um, but it don't bother me. You know. I go out there, I clock in, enjoy my time while I'm out there, clock out, do it again. Yeah, I, I think the people that matter really know what you bring on a night in, night out basis. Um, I think that's for sure. If you sell stuff online, let me tell you, you're definitely in the right business because more people are shopping online than ever before. That means a lot of orders are coming in and a lot of orders you'll need to ship out fast. That's why online sellers like you need ShipStation. No matter how much you sell, ShipStation makes it super easy to manage and ship all of your orders from all of your sales channels faster, cheaper, and more efficiently. You can import orders from any sales channel, ship with any carrier, access discounted shipping rates, and you'll spend a lot less time on shipping and a lot more time growing your business. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation funnels all your orders into one simple interface that you can manage from anywhere, even on your cell phone. You'll even get access to amazing discounts with major carriers, including UPS, FedEx, and USPS. Easily compare carriers and choose the best solution every single time. Ship more in less time. Just use our offer code LONGSHOT to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free shipping. That's right. Just go to ShipStation.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the page and type in LONGSHOT. That's ShipStation.com. Enter offer code LONGSHOT. Make ship happen. Davis, I got news for you. Bombas makes the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. Dunk, I've got news for you. They've literally rethought every little detail of the socks we wear to make them way more comfortable. I wear them every day. They, the way they hug and caress my foot uh, provides support as well as comfort. Uh, and they're stylish. They, they really, I, I believe they call it a five-tool player in baseball. <laughs> uh, they're a five-tool sock. That's right. They help give back to the most vulnerable members of our community. Because for every pair of socks you purchase, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need. The generosity of Bombas customers has allowed them to donate over 40 million pairs of socks and counting through their nationwide network of 3,000 plus giving partners. And the impact is more powerful than ever. To those experiencing homelessness, these socks represent the dignity of putting on clean clothes, a small comfort that's especially important right now. So give a pair when you buy a pair and get 20% off your first purchase at bombas.com slash longshot. That's B O M B A S dot com slash long shot for 20% off your first purchase. Bombas dot com slash long shot. I, I want to ask, since we're bringing up players around the league, I want to ask if there is a particular matchup. Uh, maybe it's an individual matchup. Maybe it's a team matchup. You know, you're from North Carolina. Maybe it's going back home and playing in Charlotte. Is there a game? That I know you get up for every game because you bring it every single night. That's one thing that can't be questioned. But is there a matchup that maybe just draws a little extra attention from you? Uh, Don't be bashful. Feel free to throw <laughs> out some names too, you know, if you want to. 
Uh, I would have to say Sacramento, just because I go against Fox. And uh, just well, Fox, actually, just Fox, Fox. And, Fox and Malik. So like my past teammates, because okay. you know we always gonna talk shit to each other. So that's that's how it kind of is in, in the NBA. So like when one of us lose, the other one's talking big shit. You know, you suck this, that, and third. So uh, <clears throat> those are kind of the games I really get up for, and I really be pushing for us to really win. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, I gotta hear that shit. You know, Duncan, you ain't gotta hear that. I gotta hear that shit in the group chat. So. Are you the reason why Malik Monk gives us 30 every time we play that? Right. Or what? Right. I mean, God damn, Bro, damn. Probably. Yeah, that, that's – yeah, I can accept that, yeah. Fair enough. I got to ask, Bam, I got to ask about the, the infamous block on Tatum last year in the playoffs. I was in, – in preparation to talk to you, I was watching some just highlights from that run. And I came across some videos on YouTube of doctors like breaking down the physics of the block and how it doesn't make sense and, you know, all this stuff. So I just got to know, was it it, because when you watch it in slow-mo, it really doesn't make sense how you're able to stop that much force with basically your fingertips. Uh, Have you gone back and watched the replay? If so, how many times? Uh, You know, is it your screensaver on your phone or have you just kind of forgotten about it and now you're moving on to the next thing? Uh... I haven't forgot it. I haven't forgot about it because I low key still talk shit to JT about it. You know, because uh, like a lot of us in my draft class grew up together. Like grew up playing AAU together, growing up playing against each other. So we all know each other. So we all talk shit. When it happened, his mom see me in the bubble. <laughs> And she was like, you know what? Like, I can't even claim you to be like my second son. Like, I just, oh, no. I can't claim you right now because we're going against you. I can claim you after the playoffs. So that's kind of like the 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 love we all got for each other. But I still remember the block. I it still feels unreal to me. Um, and you know, watching it, it felt way faster than it did in like actual time so like when the block happened in my mind it was like boom and it was over that's why i threw the ball because i had to register what happened and i was like oh shit i just this is game like game is over (sighs) and then in my mind i was like i think we're going down in history (laughs) i think we're going down in history because if you watch everybody's reaction on the bench, it's delayed. Everybody's reaction is delayed. It's a block, and then I got the ball in my hand. Everybody was like, oh, shit. So uh, it's definitely one of the, uh, I think it's top three moments in Heat history. You know, wow. I can, I I, I, that. No, I like that. I want to comment just quickly on the fact that you are really close with your draft draft class, like you said. Uh, I just want to point out how that just must be like a top 25 in the country type of thing because I'm just completely left out of that. Um, <laughs> but but just an interesting interesting little thought that like you guys probably all have like a you know lottery pick lottery lottery pick group message or group chat um, where I just don't have that. But uh, I I. I want to wrap up here asking you a question that we try to ask all of our guests, which is basically when you look back at your career and and you have a a special one already and you have still so much time um, to go in terms of at least what you're going to accomplish on the basketball court. But is there a specific moment or a experience that you feel was kind of like a a pivotal turning point um, or maybe a springboard for your success? And that might be a conversation. It might be a decision uh, or something of that sort. Is there something that really sticks out to you? You you got here my second year, Duncan, right? Yeah. You was here when I started starting at the end of the season. Yes. Yeah. So I think that was my pivotal moment in my career when I got to really start for the rest of the season. And uh, Coach kind of let me explore my game. And uh, 
you know, really explore the offense. I think that's so interesting, Bam, because social media, not that social media opinion matters at all, but fans and social media are so quick to bail on a guy if they don't pan out right away. And you're a perfect example of someone, like you said, you didn't really get that opportunity to start until the back end of your second year. So now it's like if someone's a rookie and they're not panning out right away, people are so quick to throw it to the side. It's just so interesting. I mean, you're a, again, you're a perfect example of someone who took that year, grew through that year. Now you're an all-star, you know, fast forward two years later. I think it's just remarkable. Uh, I, I feel like a, a lot of social media opinions happen when you're the top of the lottery. You yeah. Know, me and me and Donovan, I feel like we're shocking to people because you know me and Donovan, Donovan with a 13th and the 14th pick, and then you got the fifth and the what was JC third? Yeah. Yep. So all four of us get max deals, but. Nobody, if you would have looked at the draft, the draft slots when we were rookies, you would have been like, all right, the top five are getting the max. You know what I mean? And then it's yeah. shocking because it was a 13 pick and a 14 pick that worked their way through a system and became who they are. No, that's it's super interesting stuff. Um and and I've I've seen you carry that that chip um basically night in and night out. So uh, I just want to wrap up here. We got our little undrafted segment. Uh, we'll just do a little quick hitter here. Uh, we're going to start off. So once again, Bam, just to remind you, this is the underappreciated. We want underappreciated answers, the sleepers, if you will. Um, so we're going to give you three topics. And yeah, just kind of, you can ex you can expand on them if you'd like, but or, you know, if you want to just give a quick hitter answer, that's cool too. Uh, we hear that you're a Katy Perry fan. So uh, we want to know, the people want to know, the masses want to know. Everyone wants to know. What your undrafted Katy Perry song is. Uh, TGIF. Ooh. That's, that's a, border, a borderline answer. I don't know if that's underappreciated, but it's a good song. Don't get me wrong. But that's it's a smash. I think most people would agree that song's a smash. Yeah, but all her music is a smash. That's I true. Think. Everything everything KP touches is, is a hit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's kind of the one where I thought was kind of underappreciated because it's it's such a great song and like everybody knows it, but it's like everybody's like, yeah. I, I, I think it's second tier. I think that's a fair answer. Yeah. All right, we'll we'll let it slide. I got the second one. Bam, the other people the other question that people want to know, everyone's asking. The word, the other word on the street is you're a big sleep with the TV on kind of guy, which I relate to, by the way, helps me knock out. So is there a TV show, an underrated TV show, maybe one that people wouldn't think of that you like throwing on before you go to bed? I fall asleep to a lot. Uh, I, will, I got a couple. I got a couple I fall asleep to. It's kind of like a little rotation. Oh, okay. Give me one. So it's Boondocks. Oh. Family Matters. Okay. Oh, uh, losing my trend of thought. I mean, either of those work. We could just I, leave it at that. Yeah, Boondocks is a Boondocks <laughs> is a great work. call. Boondock the uh, uh, dancing in the middle of the street to burn, and the Boondocks is an all time. That's an all time television moment. Um. All right, we'll, we'll bring it back to basketball here for this last one. I want an undrafted, underappreciated aspect of your game, and this is what you feel is underappreciated. Something that you bring to the table that does not get the notoriety that you believe it deserves? I would say my scoring ability. Mm. But like that's one of the things that's like truly underrated because when I came into the league, I wasn't just a scorer. You know, I was a, a, de a defensive kid. Like That's why I got to play. I brought defense and energy. And uh, slowly as the years got going on, I've become more offensive and uh, – I think people just underappreciate it a little bit. You know? I agree. I, you, the thing is, you do it efficiently too, which I don't think a lot of people realize. Like you can score with volume and do it efficiently, which is obviously the, the sign of a good score. And you get to the free throw line, which is also another sign of a, a good score. Um, and you make your free throws, man. What, what are you eighty five? You eighty five percent this year? Uh, 
Yeah, something like that. Somewhere around there. We Some, that reminds somewhere me. In the 80s. That reminds me, we on an earlier episode of this podcast, Bam, we shouted out people around the league who were quote jacked but good free throw shooters, and you made that list. So congratulations, you're on the list. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it's, it. It's it's a pretty coveted list to be on. Um, somewhere in the middle of your All Star appearance, it, it's somewhere around that level of uh, praise. But uh, all right, Bam, we really appreciate you taking the time, man. We know you got a lot going on, so thank you for. Uh, for taking the time and chopping it up a little bit. And uh, yeah, appreciate you. Doing the same shit you're doing, thank you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you would think so. But then then again, it's hard to get you on the podcast. We've like tried multiple times and you just want to keep punting it down. First of all, one time. <laughs> Twice, one time. dude. I, I asked you a month ago and you <laughs> said, yeah, I got you. It's all right. We're not going to get into it now. We can talk I about this. Say, Duncan asked me one time and I was like, all right, Duncan, I got you. And then I forgot I had other Zoom calls. Understand. Told Duncan, look, bro, got to reschedule. Do it next time. Listen. Then well, Duncan hits me today, 15 minutes before this podcast, <laughs> first of all. You're letting our secrets out. Yeah, 15 minutes before. And he's like, yo, bro, I need you. I got you. <laughs> and it's it's so appreciated. I, and I'll say this. Have we, have we rescheduled a couple times? Yes. On the spectrum of being easy to deal with, you are you are awesome. Most Top of, of our guests, most of our guests are in absolute struggle. Uh, so I, I really appreciate you. Uh, you you, you, you been great. Thank you for taking the time, man. Yeah, bro. Y'all got it.